what? Say we take the word hell out. What is another word we can put in there to replace hell? Enemy. No. Read verse 18 again. They loathed all manner of food. They were at the gates of death. Oh, at the gates of death. Okay, so when Jesus is talking to Peter and he's telling him, Thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of death, death cannot stand against it. Right? So we ask ourselves, uh, and let, let, let's, let's make sure we read that verse correctly, okay? So this is why I want to go to Matthew verses uh, 16 and 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. Let's read from 17. You can go ahead. Read it. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. Okay. So, what Jesus is telling him that the gates of death no more are going to be in your way. You're going to possess it. So we're going to be possessing eternal life. All right? We don't want to go and possess hell. What would we go and possess hell for? <laughs> we don't want hell. We want heaven, right? So there has to be two gates. There's got to be a gate of, of, uh, of hell and a gate of heaven. So now you think about this. The gates of death cannot hold you. The gates of hell are not... The gates of hell... Or the gates of death that before everybody that died would go down to the netherworld because that was the only way down because Jesus had not died for our sins so once we when once we went inside the gate was closed we were locked inside Jesus is going to break because he broke the bands of iron and he threw, tore down the bronze gates so he, he broke the gates of hell or the gates of death now now hell now death cannot keep us in there anymore okay but Jesus says, and I always thought this was a, a, a now now this verse makes more sense to me. So he's he's broken the gates of death. So so Peter can come out, right? But what is the next thing in verse 19 that he tells him in Matthew? So that's why they, that's why they say that the Peter has the key. Right. But key to what? To him. Okay, read what, what it says. So he has the key to the gates. You see now what the, the one gate is torn down, but he has the key now to open the gate of heaven to go in. Right? So you get out of hell, where are you going to go if you can't go into heaven? Right? right? Is this all coming together? This is why this, this lesson on gates is so very important. But we have to know where, there's two, there's two paths we can go by. There's two paths, always two paths. There's, a, there's life and there's death. And Jesus always keeps telling us that, look, there's life and there's death. But what I'm recommending to you, choose life. He doesn't tell, tell us, hey, go this way. But he's telling us, this is my recommendation. I'm telling you, choose life. Don't choose that. Uh, okay. It's also telling us that that's why we should be, that's why we should love on earth because if you don't, you won't make it to the gates of heaven. Yeah. you go to the gates of heaven. Right. Now remember when we read, uh, when we read um, the promise that God made to Abraham, he said that the gates of your enemies uh, will not prevail against you. And then the second time when the promise was made to Rebecca, they also said that you will possess the gates of your enemies. And in both cases, they were talking about gates of, of what? Yeah. Enemies, right? Right, oh yeah, physical. It was always gates of the enemies, right? Okay, so the promise came down from Abraham to Isaac, then to Rebekah, Isaac and Rebekah uh, got married. And then they had, who did they have? They had Jacob and Esau. So Jacob, Jacob becomes Israel, Esau uh, got rejected, right? Jacob. Now the promise has to come to Jacob, correct? Okay, so where does the promise come to Jacob? For that, we have to go to Jacob's ladder. And let's go to Jacob's ladder real quick. And that would be in Genesis.
Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 28, verses uh, 10. Jacob departed from Beersheba and proceeded toward Haran. When he came upon a certain shrine, as the sun had already said, he stopped there for the night. Taking one of the stones at the shrine, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep at the spot. Then he had a dream. A stairway rested on the ground with its top reaching to the heavens. And God's messengers were going up and down on it. And there was the Lord standing beside him and saying, I, the Lord, and the God of your forefather Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you are lying, I will give to you and your descendants. These, okay, let's, let's go to verse 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he exclaimed, Truly, the Lord is in this spot, although I did not know it. In solemn wonder, he cried out, how awesome is this shrine? This is nothing else but an abode of God, and that is the gateway to heaven. Stop. So, again we come to the gate, and you see there's a gateway to heaven. How did that become a gateway? Do you know why? Because Abraham had built an altar there previously, and he had offered sacrifice to the Lord. So when we offer sacrifice to the Lord, we open a gateway to heaven. heaven. Now we are not talking about enemies here. We are just talking about the gateway to heaven. Because Jesus came and he destroyed the enemy. And so now we are able to go into heaven. But again when it talked about the, the, the angels. It said that the angels were ascending and descending. Right? They were going up and then coming down. You would assume that if the gateway opened from heaven to earth. That the angels would come down and then go back up. But why does it say that the angels were ascending and then descending? Things that make you go, hmm. So you see, when we offer prayers and alms and tithes to God, the angels take these gifts and they go up. And they tell God, this is the, this is the, the person's offering, right? Because we can't go up to heaven, so the angels do that for us. So they take the tithes and they go up and they offer it to God. And then God sends blessings down and the angels come back with the blessings for us. Okay? Uh, so... In, let's go to Psalm 100 and verse 4, really quick. Is the gate starting to make a lot of sense to you now? So just keep in mind, there are, there are different gates. There's, there's gates going to heaven, but there's also a gate going to hell. So we go to Psalm 100, and we are trying to go to uh, verse uh, 4. Do you want to read that? Enter the temple gates with praise, its courts with thanksgiving. Give thanks to God. Bless His name. Good indeed is the Lord. Whose love? Whose love endures forever. Whose faithfulness lasts through every age. So, the gates of heaven is also the gates of the temple. So when we are going to church, we are basically entering heaven's gates. And what are we supposed to do while we are there? We are supposed to enter the temple gates with praise, the courts with thanksgiving. But we're also supposed to give tithes and offerings to God. But it should be free will, not because we have to. So this is how we enter heaven's gates. Prayer, thanksgiving, and alms. Look at Esther 2.21. So we're going to go to Esther, and that should be, uh, I believe, right before Judges. Or Joshua or Judges. So oh, no, right after. Yes, the Ruth, right, Samuel, no, right sorry. Before Maccabees. I think it's, yeah. Okay. <coughs> Esther is one of the few books in the Bible, not one, it's the only book in the Bible where the name of God is never mentioned. Just for your general knowledge. But let's look at Esther 2.21. Chapter 2, verse 21. And during the time that 
Mordecai spent at the king's gate, Bagathan and theirs, two of the royal eunuchs who guarded the entrance, had plotted in anger to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. When the plot became known to Mordecai, he told Queen Esther, who in turn informed the king for Mordecai. The matter was investigated and verified, and both of them were hanged on a gibbet. This was written in the annals for the king's use. So the reason I brought you here was to tell you that Mordecai, who is Mordecai represented? Also by us, okay? So he's sitting in the king's gate. So just because we are sitting on, on the path to, to the gate of heaven, but we could still also at the same time be hearing stuff that's being plotted for evil. Right? So this is where we make the choice that do we join the evil? Okay, and we get lost and we go back, uh, you know, detour back down to the gates of hell? Or we make a stand over there and we go do the right thing and we inform God, right? And he, he will fix the problem. So what I'm trying to tell, explain is that just because we, we think that we are religious or we are holy or something, evil can still come in. Even though we're sitting at the king's gate, we could still hear evil being plotted. We could join the evil or we can make a stand. For example, when Satan came into the garden with Adam and Eve and he started whispering in Eve's ear, surely God didn't say. At that time, Adam had the choice to kick Satan out because he was already there in the temple in, or you could say in the, in, in, he, had already, he was already inside the gate. He could have kicked Satan out and everything would have been fine or he could have even gone crying to God and told God, look, this is what Satan is saying and God would have taken care of Satan at that time. Right? But he chose not to. So just because we are in a good place doesn't mean that we can't fall. We have to be careful. So, uh, let's go to Judges 16.1. I'm going to take you on a trip through the whole Bible, right? Or at least through the Old Testament. Let's go to Judges. Now we're just going to see different sides of what the gates actually stand for or, or what can happen to us. So we, we <coughs> Judges chapter 16. And just, uh, just start reading from verse 1 uh, to, uh, to verse 3. Once Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a harlot and visited her. Informed that Samson had come there, the men of Gaza surrounded him with an ambush at the city gate all night long. And all the night they waited, saying, Tomorrow morning we will kill him. Samson rested there until midnight. Then he rose, seized the doors of the city gate and the two gate posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He hoisted them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the ridge opposite Hebron. Okay, so we can read that and say, wow, Samson is a strong man. Or we can see the spiritual truth behind what this is telling us. Let's assume that Samson is represented by Jesus. Uh, Samson is representing Jesus in a shadow form. Okay, so Jesus is a strong man. It says Jesus went to Gaza. So what would Gaza represent? Gaza would represent the earth. So he left heaven, he came to earth, where he saw a harlot. So who is the harlot? That would be us, because we are all sinners. Okay, and visited her, because Jesus came and he visited us. He was here on earth, talking, speaking, healing. He visited us. Informed that Samson had come there, the men of Gaza surrounded him. So who are the men of Gaza? They would be represented by who? Uh, by Satan and his henchmen. Uh, yeah. And they surrounded him with an ambush at the, at, at the city gate all night long. So they weren't, they weren't at the city gate itself because they were so confident that the city gate was strong enough to hold Samson in. They would have been around the other places where they thought maybe Samson would climb over the wall to try to get out. Right? But here comes Samson and it says, and, and they are waiting all night long for Samson to, um, to kill him. Uh, tomorrow morning we will kill him. So they are waiting to kill him in the morning. Right? But just what it says, Samson rested there until midnight. So, so, so 
Samson is on, on, the, on the offensive here, not on the defense. So he goes on, a, on an offensive attack on them and he rose, sees the doors of the city gate and the two gateposts. So what do the two gateposts represent? Those are the two posts that the whole gate hangs on. So he took the two posts and the whole gate itself, put it on his shoulders and he walked up the hill. Where do you see this whole picture coming, taking you to? That's Jesus carrying the cross. Uh, Satan never expected that that would become his biggest defeat, which, which he thought was his biggest victory. They thought they had got him tied in there. So what do we learn uh, from, from, the, from, from this, uh, this uh, story? Is that Jesus carried the gates of death up, up to the top of the hill and then he died. And with his blood he paid the cost. Or he paid the price. So there's another gate there. You see all the gates coming to. So it's uh, Jerusalem had 12 gates to enter the city. right? They had the sheep gate, the eastern gate. So the king's gate. They had the, the eye of the needle gate. So various gates. Just like that, similarly in that same fashion. Uh, hell also has many gates. Okay, let's look at ourselves. Okay, how how many gates do we have? Eyes, ears, and mouth. Eyes, ears, mouth. What else? One more. It's the nose. So how many ears? The five senses. Yeah, it, it covers all the five senses. But how many ears? Two. Two. How many eyes? Two. Two. How, how many nostrils? Two. Two and one mouth, right? So total how many? Two, four, six, seven. That's the seven lamp candlestick. It's a number of perfection. So we can either let good things in and open up the gate or so basically what we are trying to teach, what, what we have to come to the end of this lesson as far as gates are. And so who is the worst who is our own worst enemy? Ourselves. Ourselves. So Jesus says that you are the city, right? You are the city and you have to protect your own gate. So how do we protect our, our ear gate? Discern. By, learn, by listening to good things and not uh, going around in bad company where they're talking garbage all the time or uh, cracking dirty jokes. That's how we protect our ear gate. How do we protect the eye gate? By seeing pornographic stuff or anything that is evil or lust because when, when you look at something you lust after it. Lust we think of lust always in the, term, in the terms of adultery or sexual sins. But, but eyes could also be lusting after anything. Like we could be lusting after food. Covet. Coveting and looking at something that we just want. It, it doesn't have to all, always be about sex. What would you think uh, the mouth? The mouth is one of the unique things where not only do things come out, but things also go in. So how would the, the mouth be a gate? Good, stuff. good good food or bad food and so we destroy our body because Jesus says our, our body is a temple so what what would what could we be putting into our bodies that would desecrate the temple it could be uh, drugs or alcohol or tobacco or stuff like that that would be desecrating the body so we have to protect ourselves not just what we think is sin but we could also be desecrating our bodies through through stuff that we think is good so we have to protect our gates. And Jesus says that I am I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And whoever opens the door, I will come in. So we are we are the temple, we are the gate. We are the door. Jesus is also the door. So did we understand gates? A little bit more. All right, I guess we can just end with a prayer. You want to close? Thank you, Father, for this beautiful Saturday and this wonderful Bible study class that we're having today. We continue to ask you to watch over us, our brothers, our friends, our family, that we continue to walk in the footsteps of your son, Jesus, instructed us to. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.